Hey everyone, this is Matt here. I'm here with some updates on the show. We're making some changes in light of some scheduling issues that we have coming up. So as many of you know from our previous episodes, Chris has gone on sabbatical for a year, so he's going to be away from a bit. And Don is also going to be stepping away just for some time while Chris is away. Um, Jess and I are going to continue with the podcast, and we are going to have some fantastic guest hosts coming up over the next year. But because of that, we are going to be switching to a once a month schedule for, for at least the next year. And we're going to see how that goes. It's it's so much fun for us to put these episodes together, but they do take a fair bit of time. So uh, my apologies that you'll have fewer of these in your feed, but we do hope that you'll continue to listen and give us all the feedback that you've been giving us. Now on to the show. And then she tells me, she's like, it was like egg salad and it was, it was like hot. <laughs> you know? and so, right, Nick, can we edit out hot egg salad? Because that's just gross. Yeah. <laughs> she's correct. And it's oh. really disgusting. <laughs> Welcome once again to Free Associations from the Boston University School of Public Health, the Public Health Medical Journal Club podcast for anyone who is as confused by the latest health study as I am by why do we still have snow days? Mm. So last last mm-hmm. week, did you guys have a, a snow day for your kids? We did. We did too. Why? I mean, I understand we don't want to do there. remote no. schooling as a general rule mm-hmm. anymore, but we've set up this infrastructure where we could actually keep going. I don't understand it. I think it's still something people look forward to as a place to breathe, day to breathe. I think it's this, I, I agree. I think it's the psychological impact of the snow day and not wanting to take that away. I think that's true, kids. but you, yeah. you, it's not like the, the, the day goes away. You right. have to make it up at the I end know. of the year. I know, but it's I'm, true. You know, a lot of kids go to camp by that point anyway, so are on vacation already. I feel like there's a lot of kids, at least in our district, who are gone by those like snow days because our, our, our year goes to like the end of June now. Mm-hmm. So the parents are like, no, whatever. We're out of here. We're out of here. But June, June, June when you look back at your snow days, here, don't yeah. you remember playing in the snow and hot oh, chocolate right. and just watching movies? I mean, without the snow days, our kids won't have those memories. So, yeah, so you're right. But I also remember playing on uh, slides that were completely rusted and, you know, <laughs> we, kids breaking their arms. So like there, are, seat belts. there are a lot of things that I look back on and I think maybe that wasn't the best way to have done things. So I don't know. I don't know. All right. Well, I am Matt Fox from the Departments of Epidemiology and Global Health at the Boston University School of Public Health. I am joined once again by my co-host, Dr. Jessica Liebler from the Department of Environmental Health at the BU School of Public Health. Welcome, Jess. Thank you so much. And we are fortunate to have a guest today. Chris is away, and we are so excited to chat today with Dr. J.C. Grease from the Department of Community Health Sciences. Do I have that right? You do have that right. I kind of feel like I'm an American Idol, like the new judge that's come on. Uh, that's great. Kind of there cool. will be a talent competition, <laughs> awesome. and you will be required to judge <laughs> I Jess will and be I. singing. <laughs> I'm ready. We have the microphone for <laughs> yes, it, so idea. perfect. Did you know Nick tap dances? <laughs> Can't wait he's to see gonna, it. He's, you're going to tap dance, right? <laughs> is that true? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Nick, so I, think I we just, just guessed, say he won. I, I just it. guess that Nick tap dances and he does. And so that's he, he just well, won. He did as a kid. I don't know if he still does, but we'll, well, leave we'll it test at that. him soon. We're, we will. <laughs> and as a reminder, head on over to the Population Health Exchange website at www.pophealthex.org. That's BU's hub for lifelong learning. You'll find all kinds of fun and interesting things, including maybe a, a video of, of JC soon talking about uh, PHX and how amazing it is to collaborate. And another reminder, give us a rating on iTunes, Stitcher, whatever your favorite podcast app is. That is how people will find the show. Speaking of the show, now on to the show. So today in our first segment, which is our journal club segment, we are going to talk about a study on fruit and vegetable intake and its impact on weight. In the second part of the podcast, which is our deep dive, we will talk about the new normal after COVID. And then in our third segment, The Amazing and Amusing, we'll get into things that make us laugh out loud or just plain interested in us. So let's dive into segment one. So we're talking about an article on the impact in fruit and vegetable intake on weight. It was published in PLOS Medicine, and it was titled A Nationwide School Fruit and Vegetable Policy and Childhood and Adolescent Overweight, a Quasi-Natural Experimental Study, a title with a lot of detail in there. It is by first author Brent Overbro. Is, uh, that's my best approximation. My apologies. I don't know how to pronounce the O with the 
slash through it. But from the Department of Sports Science and Physical Education at the University of Agder, Kristiansand in Norway. So this was one that was just of interest to us. I don't have any. I, I looked up. There are no. There are no headlines I could find for this one. But Jess, can you walk us through what they did in this study? Sure. This was an interesting an interesting study in part because of. The implementation of policies without maybe a firm evidence base and also the relation to some of our school lunch policies in the United States and just kind of dietary guidance in general. So I thought this was overall kind of an interesting one to start with. So what these authors were looking at are school policies where fruits and vegetables are given out free to children at school to encourage healthy eating habits. And these policies are widespread throughout Europe, with currently 22 of 26 European countries having provision of free fruit and veggies to children at school, although obviously this is less common in the United States. Despite these policies throughout Europe, there is limited information on whether or not these policies actually help and whether or not they affect dietary habits and indeed reduce weight in children or prevent children from becoming overweight, which would ostensibly be one of their core goals, but there's a limited evidence base to evaluate whether or not that actually happens. So these authors were looking at that question, and they were looking in a Norwegian cohort of children between the years of 2007 and 2014, Norwegian combined primary and secondary schools. So this was a little bit in the weeds in terms of which types of schools were required to give out the free fruit and veggies and which were not. But in Norway, during this period of time, certain schools that combined primary and secondary education were required to provide free fruit and veggies, while elementary schools for younger kids were not. And so the assu- my understanding of the assumption there was that the older kids were more likely to be kind of actively making food choices in their adolescent years, and that, and that it was more likely also to affect weight gain in the older years of children. And so that was kind of the theory behind this divided approach in the Norwegian schools. And what the authors did is they kind of leveraged what they called this quasi-natural experimental design to look at whether or not the children who were provided free fruits and veggies in this primary secondary school environment actually were less likely to gain weight. And they used a number of different outcome measures. We'll talk about that in a second, compared to the children who were not provided free fruit and veggies at school. And to answer this question, they used data from approximately 10,000 children across the Norwegian growth cohort. Data was included from children who were in the cohort from 2010, 2012, 2015, and 2017. And this was a nationally representative sample of children um, that included both longitudinal and cross-sectional biometric anthropomorphic data. The authors used this data from this cohort to evaluate the relationship between these policies in school, um, BMI, overweight, and an assorted other weight to height and waist circumference variables and obesity in two cohorts of children and children who were in third grade and children who were in eighth grade. So eight and a half year olds and 13 year olds. And these children were exposed to the free fruit and veggie policy for up to four years during the study period. The authors evaluated the growth trajectories of these children, which I thought was kind of interesting. They looked at the growth trajectories prior to the intervention, and then after the intervention. So they were looking at basically aggregated individual growth slopes across these multiple outcomes. They stratified by cohort. There were four sub-cohorts within this Norwegian growth cohort. And they also looked at the pooled data. And there was this was individual level data where the school had an ID. They knew what school the child attended. And that was linked to data that, that reflected whether or not the school participated in the free fruit and veggie policy. They adjusted for various covariates, including region, the cohort, population density, parental education, and pre-intervention, BMI, in some models. And they stratified by sex and by socioeconomic status to look at effect modification across these relationships in different ways. So the results of their study, kind of the big gong, is that at age eight and a half, there was little evidence that up to two and a half years of exposure to free fruit and veggies at school impacted any of the weight measurements in either or the weight metrics or the growth trajectories in 
either boys or girls. If anything, there seemed to be some data to indicate that children exposed to the policy had greater weight gain. Although these findings were not statistically significant, there was some evidence of heterogeneity across the cohorts, but it was inconsistent and there was kind of no, no consistent theme that we could really call on as a trend. And again, at age 13, even among the children who had four years of exposure to this policy, there was little to no evidence of effect of this free fruit and veggie policy on the overweight obesity metrics as well. So their conclusion was that free fruit and veggie policies alone are unlikely to reduce weight gain in children. Bummer. Oof. It's rough. I know. I I was hoping for a better answer. Okay, so JC, what is your take on this study? Good study, bad study? So I have a few different takes. I think that the the methods are actually sound. So this is coming from someone who's done a few evaluations of policy-based fruit and vegetable programs and healthy eating initiatives. I think the methods are sound. I think the outcome may have been misaligned with what mm. they were trying to do. So, you know, in terms of the the soundness of the methods, the anthropometry measured, you know, using standardized protocols, which was great. They really did a nice job of defining the outcome of BMI and using the standard deviation score as well as adjusting for pre-intervention. The interrupted time series design they used, I think, was spot on. It's a it's a great design to use, especially with children, because it accounts for natural growth and maturity. So it allows those multiple time points kind of before the intervention and after the intervention. So and, and maybe we should say that interrupted time series means essentially we're looking at trends over time and we're looking to see whether there is a break in the trend or a jump in the trend at the time at which this policy would be implemented to see if there's, there's really a, a change. Exactly. Yeah. So you interrupt that series with the with the intervention itself. And they, they you know, looked across multiple years of, of data, which is when you're looking at body mass index, which is hard to, to shift, yep. you definitely want to use multiple years of data. So those were the strengths. And I, I think for me, that's where I leave it with the strengths because I have, a, I have issues with both the exposure status and also the outcome. All right. So- First, the authors didn't talk a lot about the policy itself. Yeah, in the I, abstract, they I talk about to know more. right. Yeah. So I so I dug and I got down a rabbit hole. But oh, I dug. Good. <laughs> yeah, good. Yes. I did not. Okay, so I found a study from 2010 that was co-authored by one of the authors on this one, mm -hmm. and what they did was a randomized control trial. I think this was before it was a national policy, so it was just a program at this point, point. and they randomized 24 schools to receive the program, which is the once daily free fruit or vegetable, and 24 schools that did not. And they did baseline surveys done in 2001, so before introduction of the program. And then they did them at follow-up in 2008, so you know seven years after introduction of the program. And they did find that there were increases in reported fruit and vegetable consumption in the schools that had this policy. And so that's where I think this study is misaligned. This study is looking at body mass index. It's looking at weight status which is not the goal of this policy. The goal of this policy is to shift consumption behaviors mm -hmm. of fruits and vegetables. And I understand they're using you know, secondary data sources. They didn't really do primary data collection. But to make such a drastic conclusion that this policy doesn't work because it didn't shift the dial for body weight, when that's not what the policy was aiming for, I think is, is, is a disappointment because really what we're looking for is a shift in consumption. When you offer a free fruit or vegetable once a day, and then expect, even four years later, that it's going to shift BMI is, isn't an, an appropriate outcome measure. The exposure I also have an issue with because in the abstract, they talk about participation. And then participation is not mentioned again in the article. It's, it's exposure to the policy. So just because you're exposed to the policy doesn't mean you've, you don't uptake the policy, right? So we have no idea if these students actually consumed the fruit or vegetable, what they did at home, what they did, you know, outside of school, none of that. This 2010 study that I went down the rabbit hole with did look at that. <laughs> they did daily intake of fruit and vegetable, both in school and outside of school, which for this age group, I mean, outside of school is a huge influence. You're talking about parents, you're talking mm -hmm. about siblings and peers. So for me, I think I think that the methods were awesome. I really do. I think it was a really great way to approach looking at a policy on body mass index, if that was the right outcome. Mm -hmm. I just don't think it was the right outcome for mm -hmm. the study. Fair mm -hmm. enough. And so if I understand correctly, what you're saying is 
that if we take the results of the trial that you're talking about as happening the same result, getting the same results in, in practice, then what we would expect to see is an increase in fruit and vegetable consumption, just not necessarily a decrease in BMI. Exactly. I mean, I think there's a reason why this RCT, this randomized control trial happened in early 2000, and then it became nationwide policy. I mean, it showed effectiveness in increasing fruit and vegetable consumption. So clearly there was something there for Norway to say, let's implement this large scale. And then I just, I, so I think the research should continue along those lines of looking at consumption and what that does and what that does to outside of school behaviors, because mm. that was not examined here and it was examined in that that 2010 study. And so it seems to me it's a, it's, it's a reasonable question to ask, does provision of free fruit and vegetables reduce BMI? But your point, I think, is that's not the only outcome we would care about. And so the conclusion from this study can be correct that it doesn't reduce BMI. That doesn't necessarily mean the policy is not succeeding. Exactly right. I think fruit vegetable consumption is a small slice of what you would need to reduce BMI, and it's certainly an important slice. But you know, it, it, childhood obesity is such a multifaceted issue that you can't rely on one policy taking one piece to, to move the dial that much. Yeah. It really has to be kind of this concerted effort across the board. And when you're talking about children, it has to involve home. Mm -hmm. It can't just be at school. Or limit then your outcome variables to school-based variables. Again, consumption in school, maybe purchasing in school lunch lines, even, again, uptake of the exposure. I mean, we have no idea if these children even accepted the free fruit and vegetables. That would have been really important. The interesting thing about the 2010 study is it increased fruit consumption, but it did not increase vegetable consumption, <laughs> which is actually not surprising since I think to any of us who have kids. <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah, I heard someone say the other day, and I'm just repeating this with no reason to believe it's necessarily true, but that that we have evolved biologically to react to sugar and therefore fruit would be something that we would we would find attractive because it it has that sugar that gives you the whatever dopamine hit or whatever mm -hmm. it is and we did that we developed that way because it, we needed we needed sugar and you know that was sort of harder to find whereas we didn't develop a you know a, a dopamine type response to vegetables because green leafy things in most places were just abundant and they were everywhere and you could find plenty of those. So I, I, I don't know if there's any truth to that, but my point being, it does fit with what you're saying that fruits over mm -hmm. vegetables does sound to me like what my kids would do mm -hmm. to the extent that they would eat the fruit at all. Especially well, if it's covered in chocolate. Right. You know, you don't really see chocolate covered vegetables, but chocolate covered fruit for sure. Okay. So I have a, I have a, I have a theory. I stole this mm -hmm. from, from somebody who used to work here at BU, but that there is no, there is no food that cannot be improved mm. with either chocolate or bacon. Mm. One of those two mm. will improve. Mm. And people have come up with counterexamples that I don't really consider food. <laughs> like uh, cardboard. Yellow <laughs> no, like 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 yellow M and, um yeah. yellow uh, lifesavers. That's not really mm. a food. But anyway, I still think chocolate uh, would be better. I do too. I was anyway. I was gonna say bacon. <laughs> Ba Actually, bacon with life yeah. savers? and lifesavers. You know, sweet salty. Yeah. Okay, all right. That's Next funny. time you guys are recording, I'll bring you a little appetizer. You can let sweet. me know. I mean, yeah, salty. Mm. Jess, what'd you, what'd you, yeah, you know, what'd you think? So, so I don't have the kind of professional background in these policies to kind of have the perspective that JC does. I mean, I was I was viewing it more from the perspective of a policymaker who would say, we're investing all this money, Norwegian policymakers, in giving free fruits and veggies. Show me the evidence that it's doing something. And to a policymaker, the idea that it is setting the kids down a path of increased produce consumption, which it sounds like it was from that earlier trial, that's not giving me the concrete benefits that I want to see in the present to justify the expenditure, which I'm sure it's a lot to be shipping kind of fresh produce to schools across the country every day. You know, I want to see something in the here and now. Like I don't, I, I care less about kind of healthy eating habits across the life course if that is not, I want to see where, mm. I want to see the money, I want to see the savings. And I think that was in part what was driving this mm. outcome because it was something that they could capture on the medical record. 
So I, I, I understood kind of why they chose this hard outcome. And I think you're right that they, they chose a diversity of outcomes to like look at children's growth. And I like the figures that they had where they had these plotted kind of different curves. And so you could see, was there an inflection point or not? And how did they overlap by these different strata of gender that they looked at, for example? And so I think they visualized their, you know, their, their kind of lack of findings very well. But I, I, I felt like this was being driven by by policy questions and kind of that cost-benefit ratio of the expenditure on free fruit and veggies. Yeah, yeah I, it's interesting. I, I I sort of fall in between mm-hmm. both of these two points because I do think it's perfectly reasonable to ask the question, what is this policy doing on BMI? Mm-hmm. It's also perfectly reasonable to ask the question, what is this doing on healthy eating behaviors? And and those are both two interesting questions. I, I JC, I agree with you on the conclusions. I think it's where I would probably you know, pull it back a little bit. But it, as I, I, I read this, I started thinking about, so, so when I think about policy and policy analysis, it, to me, in the language of, of clinical trials, essentially that's intention to treat, right? Mm-hmm. It is, mm-hmm. let's put the policy out there. Let's see what impact it has on the outcomes. And then maybe I don't know if it failed, like it supposedly failed in this case, what the, what the reason for that is. Could be that it just has no effect, or it could be that they are not taking the, you know, they're not consuming the fruit and vegetables. And therefore, if they did, it would have this benefit. But it's a policy, right? I mean, the, the idea of the policy is we're not going out and forcing kids to eat fruit and vegetables. We are offering it to them. And therefore, whatever happens, happens. It'd be nice to know what did happen, but they obviously, they didn't have that data. So it seems to me in both, you know, those are those are both interesting questions that we could ask. And I, I, I don't think that there's anything wrong with what the authors chose to do so much as I I would agree with you. It doesn't answer all the questions. And I think that I just think the statement, the conclusion is drastic. I, that's my concern with us in public health with policy is that we put policies out there. We don't do good proof of concept, right? We don't do it on a smaller scale and figure out how the policy will function best before putting it out there. We just put it out there and then we evaluate it. And and usually the evaluation of it is not going to be ideal and we're not going to get the outcomes right away that we want to see. A policy needs to be in place for a while and it needs to be supplemented with other efforts. It can't just usually it can't just be one policy. And so I think that was my my frustration with this article is that these authors made this kind of resounding conclusion. And when you look at where the authors are coming from, they're largely practitioners. Mm-hmm. I mean, you have right. public health, nutrition, sports science, physical education, maternal child health, evaluation of public health measures. I mean, I think these authors could have done a better job if they were going to make that conclusion, which is the conclusion to make based on the data, to to couch it in a way where they offer up some alternative solutions for how this policy might function better. Because I think to throw a policy like this out the window based on this data is doing a disservice to the field. Sure. You know, I think we really would need to explore it in with education and with other policies and let's look at the uptake and things like that. And I think given the background and the variety of the diversity of these authors, they 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 could have done a more thorough job of, of outlining the implications and next steps for research. Sure. Sure. I, and to be afraid of the authors, I don't know that they would say this This implies we should throw out the policy. But it does. you are getting at one of my issues in general, and I know I stand alone on this, but I don't care what conclusions authors draw. I mean, you, you hear people say all the time, well, you know, the, the methods were fine, but, you know, they, they overinterpreted their data. I don't care what anybody else. I mean, people think lots of things about their own data. They are not in the best place to interpret their own the, the, the implications of their own. I mean, they're they're in good place to judge the the quality, but but not in a good place to judge the implications. That's why I hate policy statements in 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 papers in general. And so, to me, I, I don't you know I don't necessarily want to read the author's you know conclusions and or implications. And yet we are, we're almost required to do that. Now, people would disagree with me and they would say, well, you may think this way and other scientists may think this way, but this is going to get picked up by policymakers and policymakers want a conclusion and they're going to read it. And therefore you should be cautious in the interpretation. I'm just saying as a scientist, I don't, I'm, I pay, I put, I don't care if people over interpret their data or underinterpret their data because I'm not interested in their interpretation of the it's, data. You know, it's interesting because I feel like at least in my field, there's a pressure now on researchers there to interpret is. your data. Otherwise, someone else is going to interpret it and they couldn't, they could misinterpret it. Sure. Mm-hmm. And they could take it off in the direction that you think is not what your data is actually saying. And so the onus is on you to do it, to do it before someone does it for you. 
And I agree it's a tough spot for those of us who feel like we were trained in science and not communication or risk communication or data communication, but still kind of or policy analysis or policy relevance or practice or any of these fields to really feel like we have the skills and the knowledge to fully interpret our data. But that communication piece is key because it depends on who you're interpreting it for. I mean, you could take the same study, right? If it's for policymakers, if it's for school administrators, if it's for parents, you would interpret it and you should communicate it in a different way for those audiences because they connect to the information in a different way. They're motivated by different factors. And that's what we don't do well in public health. We don't know how to communicate our findings in a way that resonate with the people who need to hear it. We just put it out there. Matt, I think you should start a journal actually where where a authors are not no, required. No interpretations. <laughs> yeah. Because that would, that would cut data. our time in, in producing manuscripts in half. call it raw data. <laughs> I, I totally agree. I, also, I will also say I don't like um, when authors tell me what the strength of their studies are. Um, you just want all the weaknesses. Well, I, it, the thing is, I want I want the weaknesses, but even then, I don't trust mm. authors to appropriately mm. describe their own weaknesses because it's human nature, right? What's my yeah. What's my incentive to say I did this study and I did it terribly, right? I have I have none, so I'm going to tell you about the things that I think will meet the bar for getting it published, but I'm not going to tell you that. You know, here and here are the reasons why you should completely distrust everything that I just said. So, I it's nice to have it there. It's good. It's a good starting place. But I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna try and think on my own as to what the limitations are. So I, I'm not saying we should get rid of people telling us about the limitations. <laughs> I'm just saying I don't, I don't take them as necessarily a, a, a given. Yeah. My my other question about this. So, JC, you said you you and maybe I misunderstood, but but it sounds like you looked into this policy a little bit more. How mm-hmm. did how does this actually work, right? Because is the idea we're just putting fruit and vegetables out there and anybody can take them. And so then they are presumably I, I bring my lunch to school or I, you know, I get my lunch from the school, whatever it is. And then in addition to whatever I was going to eat, I'm also going to eat additional I so. fruit. I, I wouldn't expect that to reduce BMI unless there's something about fruit and vegetables that is satiating that causes me to eat less later. But, exactly. But but just sort of as an absolute, it didn't it didn't strike me as this would necessarily be the kind of thing that would reduce BMI unless I'm what I'm doing is is saying, okay, I'm gonna eat the fruit and therefore I'm not gonna eat this thing that I was gonna eat otherwise. Right. And and the authors actually say that that if you think that introducing fruit and vegetable into a diet is going to reduce BMI, it has to replace something, right? They have to lower their saturated fat. They have to get more physical activity. Something else has to happen. So they actually do acknowledge that. But yes, that's exactly right, Matt. I think they show up into the in the cafeteria and they are given a choice of there was a variety of fruits and vegetables they could choose from. They're given one. And again, without understanding if they even choose these, it's hard to know if the policy even touched them. You know, there there was a cafeteria-based intervention locally that I evaluated a few years ago, which was a fruit and vegetable intervention. And students had the choice to take fruits and vegetables, fresh fruits and vegetables in low-income neighborhoods where they had no access to, you know, never had had a fresh blueberry, let alone a star fruit, right? And many of the students at first did not take the fruits and vegetables. Mm-hmm. And we went and we went to the cafeteria. We observed during school lunch. And so the midpoint evaluation that we did, you know, eating behaviors were not changing. And it wasn't until we did, you know, raffles and competitions and really communicated around these these fruits that students started to participate. We have no idea what's happening in the schools around this policy. And that's, to me, that's a missed opportunity, especially since one of the authors on this study that we're talking about was one of the authors on, was the actually the, the first author on the 2010 paper. And I think they could have just done a better job describing what this policy was all about and how it was actually implemented in the schools. I agree. I agree. Any last thoughts, Jess? I had one one final thought. I think, you know, so in our state here of Massachusetts, at least in our town, there's an interesting parallel in that they've been giving out free school lunches during the whole pandemic for kids who've been in school. Yeah, ours too. Yeah, yeah I think it's statewide. Yeah. I think it's statewide. And, you know, so that's a, that, that was not happening before the pandemic where kids had access to some, and it's like a brown bag lunch that's just there and you just go up and take it. And it, so it's that, made getting ready for school so much easier. It has so much easier. I don't have to think right. about it anymore. But that's kind of an interesting, I you know, agree. other natural experiment that maybe someone down the line will look at in terms of, I see my eighth grader, for example, and she, it does make the mornings a lot easier, but she usually only eats the Teddy Grahams. Obviously. <laughs> yeah, right? Obviously. She does it there, and then she tells me, she's like, it it was like egg salad and it was it was like hot you know and so there's some like it's it's some kind of unappealing 
a sandwich and then there's some, and then, but there is a fruit and veggie yeah. in there. And then there's some processed sweet item, but it's there for them to take. And I think that would be an interesting thing to look at too, kind of post pandemic in it, Massachusetts. Nick, can we edit out hot? Egg salad, because that's just gross. Yeah. <laughs> She's correct. It's oh. really disgusting. <laughs> it would be interesting to look at post-pandemic, especially since the kids that really need those free breakfasts mm-hmm. and lunches are now experiencing less stigma because more people mm-hmm. are participating Absolutely. in them. Right. And so it would be really unfortunate. If we can afford to do this now, mm-hmm. it would be really right. unfortunate post-pandemic to have this go away mm-hmm. because the kids who really need it are much more comfortable now yeah. taking on those breakfasts and lunches, mm-hmm. and they should be. Mm-hmm. Totally agree. Mm-hmm. Totally yeah. agree. Before we before we end this topic, can you just tell me how do you personally define the difference between a fruit and a vegetable? What is the difference? JC's the expert. Fruit so she has can go first. Hits. <laughs> That's as good as it. Or seeds, right? Seeds, seeds and pits. Seeds so like is, that. A tomato, is a tomato a fruit or yes. a vegetable? Yeah, it's, it's a, a fruit. fruit. Is an avocado a fruit or a fruit. vegetable? I think okay. always default to fruit. That's so what I, I, so I heard somebody said this to me the other day, and I, I, I suspect it's wrong, but I'm going to use it anyway. A, a fruit is anything that the plant is happy for you to eat. <laughs> and it's a vegetable <laughs> if the plant does not want you to eat it. So like the leaves, mm. the plant needs the leaves to, to, to grow and function. Okay. Whereas the fruit, it wants you to eat so they can disperse the seeds. So a zucchini, fruit or vegetable? That would be a fruit. It's a fruit, I think, because it has seeds, right? This is, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I, don't know. <laughs> I, don't know. I think know. it's a fruit. My kids sometimes come down very hard. This is like a very common dinner discussion. But then I don't understand, what are potatoes? House. Like They're in the ground. Starch. What are, what are they there for? To, Does the a plant tuber. do something <laughs> to with it? it? What is the what does the plant want the potato for? I don't know. What, I don't know. What, I don't know what it's there for. All right. But I will say, I'm not so sure chocolate on avocado would make it better. To be honest, no, but bacon would. Bacon totally would. Yeah, oh, but you, so it's or. it's or it's or. Oh, I didn't. I didn't get that. Yeah, and okay. if you throw in uh, melted cheese, there's there's pretty much. I was nothing, actually going to say that. I was going to say, can I add melted cheese to that list of bacon, can, and chocolate, and, and cheese? And then I think it's completely bulletproof. Awesome. Coming from the nutritional, I do, <laughs> I do, I do have to just point out that one of my this this had one of my pet peeves in this article. It said among boys in the 2010 cohort, there was a suggestion of mm. dot dot dot. I, mm. I, I'm not a fan of uh, a suggestion. I okay. think they also wrote, which I know you don't like either, that they like ran the analysis in SAS. Nine point four. Yeah, like so this is, a, this is this is this is one of What's my. What's your issue with that? Yeah, this is one of my personal pet peeves that I my doctoral students are very annoyed about this. I hate when articles say we ran the analysis in SAS nine point four because that unless you tell me we use this command and this you know or here's my code, knowing that it was done in SAS does me no good. It's just an advertisement for SAS. Yeah. And so you might as well say we did the analysis in SAS and then we wrote the manuscript in Microsoft Word, <laughs> right? There's no, I'm not getting anything. And now you're reading it on Internet scientific, Explorer. Yeah, <laughs> out of that. So clearly I just gave SAS an advertisement. So, all right, let's move on to our second segment, which flows nicely from that last discussion about, you know, the sort of what's, what we do after COVID ends. We, we were looking at an article that talked about, it was in JAMA, it was by Ezekiel Emanuel called A National Strategy for the New Normal of Life with COVID. And the basic idea is that in January of 2021, Biden issued a national strategy for COVID-19 response and pandemic preparedness with the idea that we start to think about what happens as we get into the post-pandemic era. So not the idea that, that COVID is going away, but that we are moving into a world where we are living with COVID. This article came out, I guess, in probably January or February. Mm -hmm. And I think with all the changes that are happening right now here in in the United States, but but lots of places around the world where you're starting to see COVID restrictions going away, I, I think this becomes even more relevant. The idea is, what do we do in the post pandemic era, such that we are able to live with the fact that there is a, a virus that's still a, a deadly virus, but we also want to balance that with the desires of people to get back to something of a, a more normal life. The article argues that humility is, is the key to this process because we have no idea what's next. And I see a lot of – my town is, is one of them – a lot of moves away from masking, which I am – fine with like masking, you know, so our schools are, are moving away from masking. I'm okay with that. I know there are a lot of people who think I'm, I'm very wrong about this, but I'm, I'm okay with it, but 
I would have liked to have seen that come with caveats, with the clear understanding that we may have to go back to this. Circumstances may change. And I think the messaging hasn't really been ideal to set people up for an understanding. We're not done. You know, just because we are in a lull doesn't mean we're done and, and that we don't still have to think about going forward how we're going to deal with future waves if those future waves are are severe and if those future waves involve variants that are are more severe than what we've seen with Omicron. So, I, you know, it, it just seems to me we're not like with everything in the pandemic, we are being reactive and not proactive. So I, I, I use that as a starting point just to get your thoughts on the article and what you what you thought about both the article and, and what the new normal looks like. Jess, you want to you wanna start us? Sure. I thought, I mean, there were two things that, that struck me in this article. It's particularly interesting. I think the first I agree with you is that focus on humility and the term humility and like bringing up the obvious question of how do you have humble public policy? And that seems to, in essence, reflect some element of flexibility, but that's difficult. Flexible public policy difficult. is extremely difficult because it comes along with communication that's not black or white. It comes along with a sense of, well, this is what we're going to do now, but it's some unknown, unclear time in the future. We might have to do something different, and that could be go back to where we are now, or that could be something that we haven't even discussed yet. And that uncertainty in humility is challenging from a from a messaging perspective and also from kind of a, you know, sitting in your psyche perspective as just a member of the, the public. And so I think that's the challenge is kind of how do you take humility and actually make public policy with humility in a way that also doesn't undermine people's trust in your messaging. And I see that now with our schools as they're talking about, you know, how do we peel back the mask mandate and maybe it's mask optional for a while and there are certain circumstances where we would ask people to mask. And of course, if you want to keep your mask yeah. on, that's fine. But kind of how this, it's been interesting just as a parent kind of seeing how the schools are trying now to kind of come at this approach with, it's very different than early in the pandemic with the idea that we don't know what the future holds and we don't have all the answers. But right now, this seems like it seems like it's okay to take off your mask right now, but we can't we can't say what it's going to look like in June or what it's going to look like next October. Yeah, and I do want to clarify something that I said, which is that I, I I'm not necessarily thrilled with the way that you know some schools or or towns or whatever is are going about this, but I I don't mean that to imply that it's their their fault. They have been left to their to themselves to have to make really difficult decisions with no real good guidance on how to do this. So this I I I. I I don't want to imply that I think that people are getting it, you know, getting it wrong isn't really the right term. Do, doing what I think would probably be the right thing. I just wanted to come with clear messaging. And, you know, who who knows how to do that? That's really hard. JC, what was your yeah. what was your thought on this one? So that clear messaging piece really resonates because, I mean, a lot of the classes I teach here at our master's and doctoral students are about communication and messaging. And I think that because there's this need for flexibility and because public health really does need to gain the trust of the public, it becomes really hard to message because we can't always stand by our message because we are going with what we know right now, which is constantly changing. And that needs to be okay. And that needs to be acceptable. So because of this whole messaging and communication piece, I, when I was reading this new normal, triggered me a bit. Mm -hmm. And also <laughs> strategic plan triggered mm -hmm. me a bit. So oh. with new normal, I feel like Normal implies some consistency, right? Some regard of expectations that's going to be met. And I, I think by calling this the new normal, we're setting ourselves up for failure. Nothing about this is normal. And it's not whatever new normal we establish is going to change in a second. There has mm, to be a different way point. of looking at this so that we are not expecting to get back to this place where we can predict day to day. Because for, for a while, that's not going to happen. And I really do think it's going to create disappointment in the public health world, but it's also going to create a lot of mistrust in those that are looking to public health to guide them. So the new normal piece, I do have a bit of a problem with. Strategic plan, I also have a bit of a problem with. <laughs> <laughs> and not because of your association with BU. <laughs> no, not at all. But I mean, strategic plans take time to develop. They take to, we don't have the time to develop a, like a true strategic plan. They look out five, 10 years with, mm -hmm. with set goals, right? That you then work towards those set goals. We can't do that. Those goals are going to change. Usually strategic plans are done with a group of stakeholders who represent perspectives from the larger group, but this, those, that set group of stakeholders does the strategic plan. We can't afford to do that. We need the voices of the larger group. And so I think calling this a strategic plan to get to a new normal, to me, just 
feels very disconnected from exactly what we're trying to do, which is to be to to be humble and to to generate trust within you know the population and and to be flexible in what we're recommending and have people say it's okay that public health is wrong sometimes because we we don't know we only know what we have at the moment what the data is telling us what the recommendations should be and that can change in a minute as we've seen so. But all that said, I do think, I do very much agree with the author that, you know, we need a plan. And Matt, with with what you said in terms of the schools being resourced and, you know, if we change things and make new recommendations, there has to be plans in place for how to deal with the aftermath of those changes to recommendations. And I think that's where we have not done a good job, mm-hmm. right? We've just we've just issued new recommendations because we have to get something out there, and I understand that. But it has to come with some foundation of, and this is how we shift. And I hate the word pivot now, but <laughs> this is how we pivot. You know, it has to it has to be attached. Pivot to the new normal. Pivot. Using a strategic plan. And now it's time for me to leave. Thanks, guys, for having me. So, <laughs> See you Jesse's next time. Having a breakdown. So it's yeah. interesting. You 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 hate new normal. I hate new normal too. I think for a slightly different reason, which is. I think new normal means two different things to two different sets of people. Mm -hmm. To one group of people, new normal means when do we get back to old normal? And to other people, it means new normal is what we're doing right now, continued Mm -hmm. forever. And I don't think either one of those is, is very realistic. I mean, what we are moving towards is a situation, I think, where we start to relax a lot of the restrictions, but we recognize that we are not going to be able to pull back all of those restrictions. And... Some of them that we remove now may need to come back temporarily, you know, for some hopefully well-defined period of time with metrics around it so that we can deal with, you know, any future waves that are, are bad. I thought one of the interesting things I thought that came out of this beside the focus on new normal and humility and strategic planning was the idea of using an aggregate of respiratory diseases, yeah. not just including COVID, but including flu and RSV and other sorts of respiratory diseases as the metric that would decide when we might re-implement masking or distancing or different things of that sort, not just COVID alone. I, I was interested. I knew, I knew Matt would have something interesting well, to say. Well, this is an interesting one to me because so much of so many people have made the argument throughout the pandemic, people who didn't want restrictions, to say, well, so many people, X number of people die of flu every year, and we don't shut things down mm-hmm. for flu. And this is essentially making the case that, right. you know, flu should be included right. in the metric, not that flu alone, but that we should come up with a, a metric that says, for respiratory diseases in general, there's an upper upper limit of what we consider tolerable. And that's a horrible thing, right? The fact that we, you know, the fact that we consider any death tolerable is is tough. On the other hand, there's also the real world that we're living in where we have to make real decisions. So I get it. But the idea that we would include, we, we would have a broad spectrum of respiratory illness in general. I, I like that idea. I, I liked it too. I, did too. I, I thought I did it was too. like a pan-respiratory disease. You know, the idea that a death is a death and it doesn't matter if someone dies of COVID or they die of the flu or a child dies of RSV. It's the, you know, kind of this more comprehensive approach that we're not viewing COVID in isolation. Which actually I think could help package mm-hmm. that if we have another COVID-like situation down the road where now we have kind of this baseline of this is the package deal, you know, like this is how we approach it. The, the other thing I really appreciated about this, what the author was saying is I think that he was really putting out there a call to action for resources. Mm-hmm. So we talked about kind of the data structure, right? And how we need this overarching data system to help inform our recommendations and where we go. And that really struck me because I'm doing some work with the state and, you know, in Massachusetts, we have 300. 151 local health departments, all with their own data reporting, all with their own data structure. So here you have someone saying nationally, we need resources so that we can have a data system in place, right? Where if you think about one state, Massachusetts, we can't even get our act together to do to get, you know, 351 local health departments. That is a huge endeavor. And those health departments are strapped and they are doing so much incredible work. They are. So much incredible work. But I, I think that that piece about resources is really important. And, you know, I, I think to some degree, looking at what specific states are doing and evaluating best practices to roll into these recommendations is really key. I mean, in Massachusetts, we had we have the Academic Public Health Volunteer Corps, which is where, you know, in March, April 2020, we sent public health students out to the 351 local health departments if they wanted them. They helped with contact tracing and communication and call banks and everything. And that's a great model. And we yep. should be evaluating that and replicating that to the extent that we can. And so I think that need for resources, I, I know like everyone needs resources, but it is so real and it really could help push this forward if we can get those resources earmarked for these kinds of efforts. Couldn't agree more. 
All right, I think that's a good place to to leave it and move on to our final segment, which is our amazing and amusing, the segment that we love every episode. And I'm going to go first this time because I have a I have a nice short one. Well, it's it, it could be a long one, but I'm going to keep it as a a short one because I just I, it's mostly the idea that I'm interested in. So this is an article by Guido Meyer, I think is how his name is pronounced in Peer Community in Circuit Neuroscience which, as you can imagine, is not an article that I would normally come across. <laughs> it's not an art, a journal that I would read very often. But I, I just thought this was an interesting one because it essentially was trying to make the point that we can be fooled by data fairly easily and that we have to really think very carefully about the statistical methods that we used. And what he did was, the title of the article is, Neurons in the mouse brain correlate with cryptocurrency price, a cautionary oh. tale. And essentially what he did was use these the mouse brain neuron information and prices of different cryptocurrencies, and he was able to correlate them and show that actually, you know, if you were to look at this, you would think that you can predict what's going to happen with cryptocurrency based on looking at mouse neurons. But actually what he is demonstrating is there is a you know, a sort of a, a standard statistical process that is is playing out in both of these two scenarios that just makes them happen to look correlated and that actually if you tried to use one to predict the other, you probably wouldn't do very well. And certainly there is nothing causal going on. And this was not a this was not a an article that was trying to be funny. This was trying to 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 legitimately demonstrate a a, a problem that we can be fooled by data. And it just reminded me of the Somebody wrote a book not that long ago in which they took all these different things and, and correlated them like, you know, number of you know deaths from pick your disease and number of movies with Nick Cage in them that year. It's always and Nicholas Cage. It's always Nicholas Poor Cage. Guy, right? I know. He's always like the random. Do you know he has a <laughs> he has a new movie coming out in which he, he he's gonna play himself and he is like somebody invites him pays like millions of dollars to have him come to their birthday party and then some bad thing ensues and he has to like pretend to be Nick Cage in movies as opposed to Nick Cage in real um, life. I'm looking forward to that one. to not be associated with the outcome. He's yeah. like, I'm just here randomly. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> exactly. So I'm looking forward to that one. But, but my point being, I just thought it was a nice demonstration of, you know, how we can be fooled by statistics. Mm. JC, how about you? What do you got? So I figure since we are filming this on the week of Valentine's Day. Wait, is there a video camera? No, but okay. I'm going to talk about love languages. Oh, yes. Okay, mine so, is to-do lists. <laughs> that would be my two sharing. It's not Thanks. one Thanks of the five love languages, yeah. but to-do lists uh, on top of to-do lists are my yeah. thing too. Fair so my daughter is being bat mitzvah this year, mm -hmm. and as part of that, we have we go to you know family sessions with other kids that are being born bat mitzvah, and we talk about becoming a Jewish adult. So the last one a few weeks ago was on empathy. And the rabbi was pointing out that, you know, in order to really have empathy, you have to understand where other people are coming from. And so she brought up the five love languages. So Gary Chapman in, you know, early 1990s developed these five love languages, which is words of affirmation. So that's when people value verbal acknowledgments of affection, compliments, words of appreciation. And that was actually when he did his study in, in 2010, that was the most common one. Then there's quality time. People feel most loved when they're with people they, they love and those people are not you know, on their phones or devices and they're actively engaged. And then acts of service. People value when others go out of their way to do things for them, right? Gifts. People feel loved when people buy them things and it's the thought behind the gift, not just the gift itself. And then physical touch. People feel most loved when they're receiving physical affection and, and touch. And so the whole point of this was we all have our own love language, but to really have empathy, you need to step into the other person's shoes to understand their love language and then be able to have empathy. So that got me thinking about, okay, we've been in COVID now for you know two plus years. Has COVID changed our love language at all? Hmm. Because for those of us that maybe didn't have physical touch as a love language, but have not had a hug from a family member in two years, maybe physical touch is now a love language, right? Or for those of us that really appreciate quality time, but are completely sick of being <laughs> in a house of with three children, uh -huh, um, you uh -huh. know, maybe now we really want like or, acts of service. So the kids will just help around the house. Uh -huh. I mean, I may be drawing from my own personal. No, I, obviously it's right. hypothetical. <laughs> hypothetical. Just, we're just, just. So I was really interested in thinking like, is there a study out there to investigate if love language has mm -hmm. changed in COVID? And there is, there is an international study 
It is being financed by the German Research Foundation, and there are two research questions. It's called the Coping with Corona Research Project, and their two research questions are, how do different people cope with the changes and restrictions due to the COVID-19 pandemic, and why do people differ in their well-being during the pandemic and the subsequent return to normalcy? So Normal. Exactly. That triggered me. Anyway, <laughs> but there's uh, some collaborators in the United States, Stanford, Columbia, University of Texas at Austin and University of Texas at Austin is studying changes in love languages. And they have found that students' love languages have changed during COVID where people who before did, you know, really much rely on physical touch and haven't been able to do it now, now exchange letters with their families. And so it's just, it's interesting and it will be interesting to see as this evolves, you know, how our love languages change and how that maybe allows us more empathy, right? Because if you shift from one love language to another, you have a greater appreciation then mm. for that that way of seeing things. So I just thought that was interesting. And the fact that there's a, a study actually investigating it is pretty cool. And maybe we can get BU on board because I think they're still <laughs> looking for collaborators. <laughs> I think that's great. I So I um, when, that, when that book came out, I really liked it. It's a, it. To me, it's sort of a you know, it's a pop psychology. It's a, it's a way to frame things yeah. that I don't really believe that people have one love language. Obviously, it's a, and I don't think it's necessarily comprehensive, but it's fine. Like that's what we go, look to pop psychology for. But but in learning that, so then obviously, then the next thing you do is you go through all your family members <laughs> and you figure out what <laughs> is their spouse, right? what is their love language, <laughs> and then and so then the, the the obvious question then becomes, how do you then use that information? Yeah. Is the idea that I should then communicate to someone in their love language yes. or should I understand that somebody is not going to communicate to me in my love language because it's not theirs, right? So they're, they are a gift giver and I'm not a, a good at receiving gifts. So I have to understand that they are expressing love, even though it doesn't work for me. Like there's, there's a tension there. I think it's there. both though, because I think, I think it's a compromise, right? So you make that small effort to be able to communicate in the other person's love language. But then you also have to be accepting the fact that they're not always going to be communicating in yours. But as long as you know each other's, you can compromise a bit and meet each other halfway. I like it. My my other love language is well commented SAS code. Just so, you know. so I will remember that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Next Valentine's Day, and also chocolate right? covered food. Chocolate covered anything. anything. Yep. Jess, what do you got? Okay, so so this could not be more different. Really? <laughs> and now for something completely and now different. For something completely different. So I was struck. I'm sure I'm not the only one because this was in the mass media. But I was struck in the last few weeks by the news report where they were talking about how a pod of orca whales, and so some of my amazing and amusing tend to do with animals, mm -hmm. a pod of orca whales killed an adult blue whale. And it was filmed. I didn't hear this was I in the New York either. Times. This was like in the New York Times. This was like mainstream media. And it was filmed and the video was like, you know, <laughs> went viral. Okay, so of to be clear, orcas. now I'm going to have nightmares about <laughs> I didn't watch orcas the I was too and warm egg yeah. salad sandwiches. <laughs> yeah, okay, right. I'm sorry. But so it was interesting, you know, and so – so there was a research article that was published that included this video in January by a group of marine mammal scientists. And they were saying this was the first observation in the wild of orcas killing a blue whale, which is the largest living creature. On and that Earth. was the reason for including the video in the I article. Think so. okay. Okay. I think so. To actually demonstrate, no, we actually saw this. Okay. <laughs> and here it is, in case you like, don't take our word for it. <laughs> here it is. And I was struck in part by why is this news? Mm -hmm. Like kind of is it? Why is this news? You know, and they were saying, like, we always knew that orcas in the marine mammal community, it was known that orcas could kill blue whales, but they tended to focus on the smaller ones, the the youth, you know, the the young ones or the ones who were sick or otherwise weak. And it was it had not been documented that they would kind of organize to come and take down an adult blue whale. And I was struck by by like, why is this news right now? You know, why is there this video that's going viral that's showing these whales, you know, attacking to death a huge marine mammal? And it was interesting. I mean, I feel like there is a part of it, and I didn't come to a, a, a concrete conclusion, but there was something about our psyche right now that was like, we want to see this. There's a demand for this. And in part, it was because, yes, blue whales are huge. And the authors were saying this is the biggest predation event since the dinosaurs, Right. Mm -hmm. Like since there mm -hmm. were dinosaurs mm -hmm. on Earth and they were taking down, you know, huge predators taking down huge prey mm -hmm. animals like a brontosaurus, for example. And those animals were, you know, predated, predated, predated they on. Were, pred they were, they were <laughs> consumed. Consumed by a predator. Good choice of um, word. And 
you know, and the idea that we only believed it if we had to see it, mm-hmm. first of all. Secondly, that we had to see it and it had to be, it had to go on the internet. And third, then there's obviously like environmental consequences that led to this happening. Mm. And the authors talk through that it probably was a good thing for the blue whale, reflected positively on the blue whale population, that, you know, that there were enough of them to be attacked by orcas and the orcas, you know, and it, it, it kind of reflected on other aspects of the ecosystem that maybe there were fewer small prey animals for the orcas to go after. Mm. But it was... I was, I don't know. I'd be interested in your thoughts as to why why this hit us right now. Well, I mean, I think there's a shock value to that video, Mm -hmm. right? If, if I wonder if instead of a video, if it was just a firsthand account of someone really describing what happened, if it would have hit the news in the same Mm -hmm. way as a video, I think probably not. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there's something about having that video there that all of a sudden makes it front and center because people can see it. And there is that shock factor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't, I don't have any answers on this one. I just know that that is not something I want to watch. No, and, it was like almost a grotesque. And yet I, I can see why. Right. I, I can see that we live in a world where lots of people would want right. to watch that. I mean, look at how many people watch Tiger King over right. the <laughs> course of the pandemic, right? I mean, there, there's, there is this fascination with watching. Or wait, what's that show? Oh, I'm blinking on the show. Oh, uh, oh Squid right, Game. Right, Squid Game. Right, right, yeah, right. Like, right. Yeah. It was I, I, don't know, yeah. I don't know the answer to these questions, but I, I it's troubling. It was it was hitting something in our kind of collective desire yeah. for watching gruesome things, right? I it, kind of like Squid Game. I think that's exactly right. Maybe yeah. in this weird way, it allows us an escape from the suffocation or the current context that we're in. You know, it, like in a weird way. You know, maybe it used to be that you would watch like a romantic comedy or some like mindless, <laughs> you know, The Bachelor, no. right? The Bachelor is like a totally an escape from real mm. life. So in this weird way, maybe these are just escapes from what we're dealing with in the day to day. I don't know. Definitely not an escape for me. Do you, Just do, a hypothesis. Do either of you watch The Bachelor? No. Will you think less of no, either of us I if we know. admit it? I was uh, <laughs> in a years ago with several other epidemiologists. You were on The Bachelor? I was, no. No, <laughs> I was in a Bachelor, or maybe it was Bachelorette, I don't know. No, it was Bachelorette uh, Fantasy League. That's amazing. Oh. Yeah. Matt, and I had so I, much respect for you before. It just shot through the roof. I am not surprised by that. <laughs> I'm not sure why I did this, but I did it, and I did. I lost. I came in last place. Uh, Isn't that just killing you? Don't you want to do it again now to see if you can win? I really don't. Okay, never mind. No. I also <laughs> let my kids pick my team, and it didn't go well. So take that for what it is. But anyway. Blame the kids. Well, that is the end of our program. If you've got any feedback on this or any other episode or you want to suggest a study or a topic for us to take on, you can tweet us at at PopHealthEx. You can tweet me at at ProfMattFox or Don at DeepTheo1 or Chris at ID.Gill. Jess, you still don't have a Twitter. I do, but I don't use it. But maybe at some point. You're you're welcome to to tweet me as well, at Jessica Liebler. And JC, do you have a Twitter? At JC-Grease. There you go. So you can tweet us all. We want to thank our guest, JC Grease, for being fantastic, and it was lovely to get a chance to chat with you. We want to thank Leslie Talali, an assistant dean of lifelong learning at the BU School of Public Health, for supporting the podcast, and Nick Guler for sound editing and tap dancing classes. (laughs) Thanks, Nick. Thanks for joining us. We hope you enjoyed it, and we hope you'll download our next episode.